Welcome to Point Me to Jesus. I'm your host, Tara McCleary Reeves, and I am so pleased to introduce you today to Marshall Terrell. Marshall lives in Tempe, Arizona. He is the author of 27 books. He's a reporter, a journalist, a historian, sports enthusiast, husband to Zoe. And I'm just so excited to welcome you to the show today, Marshall. Thank you for joining us and talking about your most recent publication, The Jesus Music, which coincided with the release of the documentary by the same name, The Jesus Music. To see the richness of hope land upon someone's spirit via rhythm, rhyme, and melody. Sound, I don't understand it. A lot of hymns are close your eyes singing to God. I wanted to sing with my eyes wide open singing to each other. This thing, Jesus music, found its way in my hometown and it changed my life. When it comes to music and how we can express ourselves, we don't have to do it the way it was done before. You want to find a loving way to have these conversations. My generation had seen all of the civil unrest. Most of us were trying to escape the pain and the misery. Where do we go from here? You feel like something's in the wind. This soundtrack emerges. They had no idea they were helping to create an entire industry. I saw contemporary Christian music born right before my very eyes. You don't know you're a pioneer or something when you're doing it. We were just doing what we love. You had grunge, and you had pop, and you had rock, and you had hip hop. There was so much great music going on. Everything felt so fresh and new. Freedom. What we were doing said so much across the world. It was so much drama in the church. Every setback, there would be a glimmer of hope. Money, cultural influence off the charts. It's bigger than any one person or one artist. Office people, a sense of hope. Yeah, there was tension on DC Talks. Here's the deal. I've never shared this with anybody. Would you change anything? Let's not forget, music is God's idea. I think music is the most powerful universal language in the world. Music was a lifeline. It became part of the fabric of who I was. It pushed me to do some courageous things. It touches the soul like somebody talking to you, you can't. And you can do all of that in three and a half minutes. And you have made the history books in publication of being the first author to go with K-Love books. So congratulations wow. to that as well. I did not know that. Can you believe yeah. it? You have really done a lot of research on some incredible heroes of the faith, Marshall. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, they, they've all had interesting stories. Um, some like Steve McQueen was a Christian just for a little time. Pete Maravich was a Christian in the last five years of his life. Um, and as we know, Billy Graham was, you know, had some tumultuous times in his life. So um, I'm hoping that uh, at one point in time, you read that book, because that was that was a lot of a uh, lot of heart and soul to put into that book and a lot, lot to live up to to do that book as well. Well, the Lord's really gifted you as an excellent communicator. Sometimes it's hard to tell people's life stories and the way you do it is is in such a way that you feel like you're sitting across the coffee table from these people. So that's a real gift that the Lord's given you. Tell us about how you were selected to write pretty much the history, a five-year, uh, five-decade uh, history of contemporary Christian music. Well, it's that old saying, it's who you know. <laughs> and in this case, I was lucky. I knew the, the Irwin brothers because in 2016, they decided that they were going to do a documentary on the life of Steve McQueen based on my book with uh, evangelist Greg Laurie. And so we did the book in a two month span and then we pivoted right to the documentary. And that documentary had to be shot in two months as well in order to make these deadlines because we wanted the book and the documentary to come out at the same time. So we were all hustling together 
and we had such a fun time. It wasn't like it was work. It was, it was, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. So, um, and then the next book that Greg and I did was on Johnny Cash. And so we were, we're working on a documentary now. It's going to be out in 2022. Also worked with the Irwin Brothers. And so um, then I went off and I did a couple of other projects. And then I come, come to find out that uh, the Irwins, uh, specifically producer Joshua Walsh, um, called me and said, hey, we're working on this documentary called The Jesus Music. And I knew about it. Um, and then they said, you know, we're three fourths time. We think we we could like we'd like to do a companion book. And I said, well, honestly, I don't know anything about Christian music because <laughs> I had been following rock and roll and Beatles and Stones and classic rock my whole life. Yeah. And um, and they they like Greg Laurie thought Marshall could bring a really fresh perspective to this, yeah. an outsider's perspective. And and I've always agreed with that. Like if 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 you don't know anything. You come in it with with no pre- preconceived notions. You you do have to know what the highlights are. You do have to know what the milestones are, um, but you do that through research, and then you just kind of come to formulate your own opinion. So they just basically said, "Hey, we know Marshall. We love him. Let's give him this book." So huh. um, and I was getting ready to do another Greg Laurie book, um, and then my agents are the same as Greg's, and and the, and so they just said to Greg. Hey, can we, can we allow Marshall to have this book for three months and then we'll start your other book? So that's how that all happened. That is a lot. You cover from the beginning, the whole Jesus movement, uh, and then up to present day. Going back, who would you say was the most interesting or what was the most interesting piece of history that you uncovered through that journey? Well, the most interesting piece of history is is just how all it all evolved because it came out of people today. It, it, it's interesting. Today's time, I think we can definitely go back and pinpoint to 1968, 69, that very tumultuous time in history. Mm-hmm. Um, and out of the Jesus movement, it, 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 it came out of that tumultuous time period, you know, where... I mean, think about think about today. I wonder if somehow or another there could be the makings of another Jesus music going on right now that we don't know about. Yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's the same concept as that. You know, you, you came off the assassination of Martin Luther King uh, from RFK, um, Vietnam War, the height of all these things. And then all of a sudden this Jesus movement happens. And it's a, and it's a generational war as well, because, you know, you, you read about Pastor Chuck Smith, who was a World War II veteran taken in this hippie named Lonnie Frisbee yep. and the two of them combined together, you know, it's like, it's like peanut butter and chocolate combining just for a special moment in time um, to where they start this movement in the church. And the big movement of course is the music. Yeah. Um, but it's also a style of worship. It's um, it's um, not just this stodgy, old people going to church thing. It's now inviting young people because they have to realize at one point in time, the church has to live on. So that was the most important thing historically. People wise, I would say it was Larry Norman for me and Lonnie Frisbee. Why those two? Well, Larry Norman was very dichotomous um, and he's an unlikely Christian. And I, I, I don't know if that's a, a mean term or not, but um, the way that I wrote about him and the way that people spoke of him was that uh, he was a guy that was cutting edge in his music. Um, he worked during the day at Capitol Records, was that, was out at night on the street preaching, but then in his personal life, uh, away from music, um, you know, he, he stole his best friend's uh, publishing and then he later married her wife. Mm. So, um, you know, you've got all those things together and it, but it, it makes for one interesting character. But he was the guy that everybody points to as starting Christian music. Yeah. And you in your book and, of course, the documentary parallel and really audience, you have to you, you have to see both for the complete package to so read Marshall's incredible historical account. And then the documentary that that also gives the pictorial version so beautifully, although your book, Marshall, has uh, the pictures as well. You go even deeper into some of the stories and then some that are not even covered in the documentary. For instance, I think one movement that did wonders for the prayer lives of a lot of these musicians was, was Napster. Can you tell our audience a little bit 
about that and why you felt compelled to even bring that up in the book? Well, that's wise of you to, to, to pick up on that because um, uh, with, what happened with this film <clears throat> was that I was sent rough cuts of the film. So yeah. my, my story arc is the same, but I felt as a book, if I, if I wanted to differentiate myself between the movie just a little bit to give readers something to go on. Um, so Napster was, was one of those examples because in the movie, it hints at it. And, and in the movie, you only have time. You don't have time to get context because right. in journalism, they teach you context. You have, you just can't say the line and, and think that the reader will get it. You have to give a little context. So in the Napster, I go, I go through the whole chapter of Napster. Yeah. Um, and let me just set it up for the reader. In, in, in CCM, they were always chasing the secular world. Okay. Um, rock and roll had its peak in 1972 in terms of sales. Yeah. Um, and that's when, that's basically when CCM starts. So uh, the way I figured it was CCM was behind secular music about 20 years. And then the 90s, uh, CCM finally catches up to, to yeah. secular. They're selling the same, the stars are the same, the venues are the same. They're even crossing over on radio. So it's, it's all finally caught up. And then a, a little bit about a decade later, at the start of the, the millennium, Napster happens, which is this uh, song streaming service, which you get your files for free, and it basically collapsed the industry. Uh, but in the movie, it, it does. I'm not even sure if it says Napster. It just it shows these devices and it shows these machines, and you have to either you get it or you don't. Yeah. But in the in the book, I wanted to to, to go into an entire chapter of not only how it broke it down, but how the industry had to kind of shift and change with the times. It's why you see today artists um, forming their own labels. It's yeah. why artists are now on the road 60 to 70% of the time. Yeah. It's now why you see artists doing venues like wineries and sports events and uh, 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 tail tailgating events at sporting events. Um, it's why you see them doing meet and greets at concerts. It's, these are all additional revenues that they have to make up for because they no longer have mailbox money. Tell us why you think 1972 was kind of the, the pinnacle of, or the start, the genesis, I guess, of the entire contemporary Christian music. What happened, um, which you give account in the book about in Texas, in your home state? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, well, Billy Graham um, decided uh, that he was going to um, uh, put on a rock star style a concert. Um, he called it uh, the the uh, Woodstock of um, of religious music, is how he put it. And it was called Explode 1972 or Explode 72. And this was originally he he formed it with uh, uh, Bill Bright of Campus Crusade. And uh, in a, in a, so it was a week long event of, um, of uh, discipling people, uh, Bible study, and it all capped off with this great big concert. But the concert was around the city. Yeah. The big one was in the Cotton Bowl, but they had sites around the city as well. They estimate that 200,000 people had showed up for this. And so it starred people like Johnny Cash, Andre Couch, Larry Norman. Um, Rita Coolidge, um, Chris Christopherson was there. Um, so it, it was a combination of secular stars who were Christians and our own Christian stars. And so that was an event that got the attention of record executives and it made them think, mm, wow, there could be, there could be an industry here. Yeah. Um, because before the, the only way that people were getting their Christian music, their, their Jesus music, um, was either through the mail order or um, at Christian bookstores. And so Maranatha was the first record label that released it through um, through uh, Chuck Smith's church. And uh, these things were recorded for like $5,000. And they, they might have pressed 10,000 copies. And they were going out on the road. And the only way you could get these things was if you could buy, bought them directly from the artist or you did it through uh, mail order. Yeah, you really do a great job showing how incredibly hypocritical the church and Christians in general were when some of the these artists were facing a, a personal 
crises or crisis, how everybody wanted to attack instead of embrace and love and allow the Holy Spirit to work out whatever was going on in that person's life. Can you expound on that a little bit? Yes. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I highlighted that because in, in the original rough cut, they, they, they had a section called fallen angels. And so I picked a select few artists and I really blame the time because it was such a new music that I think some of the older folks in the church didn't know how to react to it. They were against it from the first place. And then the first time that these artists sinned, they were, you know, they were, they were outcasts. And um, um, so I don't think the elderly, the, or what I call the religious intelligentsia knew how to react to this other than just make an example of them. And so I think the artists felt like they were betrayed by the church. Um, I'm for, I'll give, give some examples because I wrote about it in the book. Yeah. Andre, Andre Crouch uh, was caught with drugs, um, had a chance to um, give what I call his mea culpa in uh, a contemporary Christian magazine. And he said that rather than pray about it, he went to uh, therapy about it because he was so traumatized by it, which, which is fine. But um, they, they felt that he should have said, I've prayed about this and I've been forgiven, but he didn't do that. So um, his records, uh, they stopped playing his records. and uh, he, was, he was felt like an outcast. So he left uh, the ministry, which is very sad, for um, probably a period of 15 years. Didn't come back to it until his parents died and he took over the church. Um, the same um, with, with, was with, with uh, Patty Grant and Amy Grant and um, um, some of the others that uh, I talk about uh, that, you know, it w- it almost felt like it was this pattern of, we stopped playing your records. We stopped selling your books and, or stopped selling your records in music stores. Um, we tell people not to listen to you anymore. And it's almost like today's form of cancel culture. You know, you, yeah, you, yeah. you're not just humiliating the person you're stopping them from making a living. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it was a shock to that, uh, that this came from the church, but I have to remember this was 40, 50 years ago when church elders and leaders probably didn't know how to react to this today. I've got to believe that it's better and that, uh, um, that they quietly deal with it. They don't publicly humiliate this person. They probably tell them to get into a program and let's bring you back slower. Uh, but um, that's how it was dealt with back then, which is sad your book will help modern times to see just the destruction that this is and and the anti-biblical way that that many supposed Christians uh, respond, you know, and not in a loving and kind and gracious way, but in a holier than than thou that um, that backfired. And so I, I do believe your book is is going to be, a salve, a bomb that the Lord will use even for future generations to see we don't want to repeat this particular cycle. Now, you, the research I've done on you, you did say that your mom influenced, uh, you, you do remember growing up listening to Andre Crouch. Who, who else would you say that you recall in your childhood? Well, let me set the, set the tone. So yeah. like yourself, um, grew up in a military background. And so we, even though we lived in Washington, D.C., we would go yeah. to uh, church on base. So and we, we went to a place called Arlington Hall in mm-hmm. Virginia, very, very small um, conservative church. And so it was interesting in that this was 1973 now. I was 10. But yeah. it, because you're in the military you remember things because you remember this because you were in this certain place in this certain time. Yeah. And so I remember, so we were there from 73 to 78. And so we went to Arlington hall and it was a very conservative church, but somehow or another, the Jesus music and other Jesus like figures were, were in this conservative church. And, um, and they, we, my mom started listening to Andre Crouch, Evie, uh, Torenquist and Bill Gaither. Yeah. And and after after church, we would dutifully dutifully go to the Christian bookstore afterwards and she would pick up these albums. And I would be looking at the Christian comics 
and the Christian books. Like I remember the hiding place and the cross oh, and the yeah. switchblade. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I don't know why I'd always want to get a little chick track. You remember those? Yeah. That, that would tell you were going to hell. Yeah. <laughs> I was fascinated with those things. Um, so that's how I would occupy my time in there. And she would be buying music. And when we got home, she'd be playing her music. And then I couldn't wait to play my Beatles when she was done. And you and I'm assuming your dad as a, as an Air Force veteran, he was a sports enthusiast as well. I, yeah. I did want to ask mm-hmm. you who's going to win the World Series. <laughs> My dad was funny. He was a front runner because what he would do, he's such a character. I'll, uh, he, he definitely, he pulled in, in football, he pulled for, uh, uh, he loved Tom Brady, loved Tom Brady. But what he would do in football and baseball is that he would, um, he would always buy two uniforms. And at, at the end of the game, when it looked like so, so-and-so was going to win, he'd put on their jersey and say, well, it looks like I supported the winner again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is awesome. <laughs> he <For> might, <laughs> I think he probably would be pulling for the Braves. So. Well, do yeah. you listen now differently to contemporary Christian music since you now, – now you're the one that everybody is going to go to, Marshall, <laughs> in terms of – I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but you do a fabulous job taking us to modern day music and how much easier it is for a need to breathe for instance or a lauren daigle to cross over from you know christian to to secular and there not be a controversy about it so tell us a little bit about what's going on now in in music in general and is that a good thing it's interesting. I, I think it's a good thing because um, what 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 they're saying now is we don't even have to announce we're Christian. Uh, we don't have to say we are a CCM artist. Um, it's, and I guess it's the same with me. I don't have to say I'm a Christian author. I can just write Christian uh, books, but I can also do secular books too if I want to. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think a lot of uh, CCM artists today are just saying, I'm me. I write songs that affect my life. Um, Lecrae is talking about, um, Hey, I'm, I might be a, a rapper and I mean, I might be a Christian rapper, but I don't write from one point of view. I, I write from many points of view, but, yeah. um, um, so I, and I, I don't think they do that in a calculating way either. Um, I just don't, I just feel like they don't feel the need to label themselves, even though people know they are CCM. For example, Toby Mack is going to be coming here in Phoenix, um, in a couple of weeks and he's playing a place that it's uh, uh, seats 20,000 people. And I, as I was writing this book, I, I had no clue like what a guy like that would, would, uh, would sell out to and um, 20,000 seats. Like that's all McCartney um, <laughs> sells out of rolling stones when, when yeah. they're coming. Yeah. They might play some stadiums, but they'll play indoor arenas too. Yeah. And so those people play to those types of audiences. Um, and that's, I mean, that's more than respectable. I mean, that, that is on par with, well, we're kind of back to the nineties now where, where Christian music now is on par with, with the secular world, you know, they're, they're all selling. Um, and I, I think it's good because they might be reaching the unbeliever. Yeah, absolutely. And Greg Laurie makes an appearance in the documentary and also wrote the foreword uh, to this book of yours that I, I do recommend our audience to go out and buy a copy of. Y'all have an incredible friendship. Well, he's been uh, spectacular. I mean, we did the Steve McQueen book together. And again, we had so much fun. He said, Marshall, that didn't feel like writing at all. That didn't feel like work at all. Your, your books are fun. So I was like, OK, let's just keep it fun. Let's just keep it going. So. He said, well, I've got all these ideas for other biographies. And it's like, just tell me. So, I, again, I didn't know a thing about Johnny Cash. And now we're both experts on Johnny Cash. Same thing with Billy Graham. I knew of Billy Graham. I mean, obviously, um, raised in a Christian household, I knew who he was. But I didn't really know who he was. I didn't really know his accomplishments. And then when we, I read all the other books, that was one of those – he was one of those figures where – it would be nice to own a Billy Graham book, but when you open it up, it's just not that interesting. Yeah. I wanted it. We we both wanted it to be a book that you can pick up and go, oh, okay, this is the guy's life. We wanted it to be easy to read about. It didn't necessarily want it to be a religious book. We wanted yeah. it to be a, a book about a man during his time in history. What was interesting about the history? What was interesting about the man? And what were his struggles? Because you know, 
Um, writing about people who are quote unquote saintly figures is not interesting, but yeah. if you write about what their struggles are, which, which was what we did. Um, and he had plenty of struggles, but you know, the wonderful thing about him is that prayer always got him through. It always seemed as if God opened the door for him yeah. and that, and that Billy was faithful enough to know that it was in his hands and not to worry about it. Closing. I want to ask you personally, Marshall of the, in the Bible, who would you say is your hero of the faith? Everybody points to Saul. That always seems to be everybody's favorite. Um, I like Joshua. I like Joshua because he was fearless. Absolutely fearless. <laughs> um, I would have to say him for sure. Of course, I mean, but of course, I, I enjoy as an older person in reading about Jesus and, um, and, uh, and his strength and his wisdom and his, I guess you could say many moods, although his moods were never sinful. Sinless and divine and human, and uh, and you do an amazing job glorifying him in the gift that he's given you. And thank we you so are much. Better for it. And thank you for your obedience to use your talent to draw others to the Lord Jesus. Um, we are we are the ones blessed, and what a blessing it's been to to have you on the show today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was, it was a lot of fun talking to you. Thank you. Thanks, Marshall. You bet. 